All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is our second session in web room number three. Up next, we have a talk titled Multi-Beam Sonar for Zebra Muscle Detection that's gonna be presented by Dr. Jessica Kozarek. If you have questions for our presenters, um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the window, just like you did in the first session this morning. Um, you can enter those questions at any point during the presentation. I'll be keeping track of them. And then at the end of um, Dr. Kozarek's presentation, we'll open it up for questions. So no need to save those. Um, and at this point, I will turn it over to Jess to introduce yourself and your collaborators um, and turn off my video. Hi, so let me go ahead and get my presentation up. Okay, can everyone see and hear me okay? Yes, looks great. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm Jess Kozarek. Um, I'm a research associate at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. Um, and I'm here to present an update today um, to our project for um, developing methods to utilize multi-beam sonar to map um, zebra mussels. Um, and so the idea here is, um, oops, sorry. So the challenge here is that when you're, you're trying to, um, when you have a large water body and you're trying to find um, or trying to know how many muscles are there, it's, it's really a daunting task. And, and current methods like scuba diving um, or villager sampling, et cetera, just can't give you a whole picture at a large spatial scale. And so the idea is to be able to map and quantify um, zebra mussel beds. And, and this can really help to answer the questions about is there a reproducing zebra mussel population? Um, where are they? How many are there? Um, and how do the populations change over time? And so we're trying to take advantage of um, the fact that the presence of zebra mussels can change the roughness and dense and or density of the lake or riverbed. So for example, here's an um, underwater picture of a lake bed um, that's typically sandy um, with a couple large rocks. And you can see that much of the sediment surface is covered with zebra mussels. And so that changes the characteristics of um, the lake bed. Um, as you can expect, native mussels would also change, the presence of native mussels could also change the roughness of a lake or riverbed, but in a different way than zebra mussels. So here's an image of um, two native mussels that are embedded in the St. Croix River. Um, and these mussels tend to be um, much larger and are shaped differently um, than the invasive zebra mussels. Um, and so they change um, the roughness and density characteristics of the sediment in a, in a different way than zebra mussels would. And so the overall goal of this project is to develop methodology to utilize multi-beam sonar backscatter to discriminate between substrate, native mussels, and zebra mussels. And this is a collaborative research project between um, researchers at the University of Minnesota. So myself, um, Chris Millerin, Andy Reesgraf, who's here on the um, call today, um, Naomi Blinick, um, one of our dive team, as well as McAllister College, so Dan Hornbach and Kelly McGregor um, and Mark Hovey, um, multi-beam sonar experts from USGS Grand Canyon um, Monitoring and Research Center, Paul Grams, um, and independent contractor Matt Kaplinski, um, who should also be joining us on the call today to help answer um, any technical related questions. Um, and I need to acknowledge the um, project vision um, and advice of our previous collaborator, Dan Buscombe, who has since moved on to um, a new um, position. Um, so multi-beam sonar is basically a research grade sonar that provides um, really high resolution um, or high accuracy information about a riverbed um, or a lake bed. So it can provide information about depth um, by measuring the time it takes for a sound wave to return off of a, um, a surface, a, a lake or river bottom, um, but also information about how that sound is returned or the acoustic backscatter. And it's this acoustic backscatter that can tell us information about um, what that substrate looks like um, in terms of, of roughness and or density. Um, <clears throat> so, the acoustic backscatter um, is what we're looking at to help us be a muscle detector. So again, the, the characteristics of um, 
the lake or riverbed can change the way in which sound is, is scattered. So for example, a smooth and soft surface, so a very silty surface, um, might have a very small amount of backscatter, but if a surface is very um, hard um, <clears throat> and has a lot of roughness to it, you might get a large amount of backscatter. And so we're really looking to this backscatter to, to help us um, help tell us if an area of lake or riverbed um, has mussels or not. Um, <clears throat> so, oops. So the first question we asked is, is um, can we use this to, to help us um, detect muscle containing substrate. And so we started in the laboratory um, because this has, not, while multi-beam sonar has been used to classify different types of substrate um, in this way to detect whether you have sand or gravel or larger rock, for example, it has not yet been used um, to detect the presence of muscles. And so we started with laboratory experiments um, where we could control the variability. We could control the water depth and the water chemistry um, we could control what sediment was present and what the density of muscles were um, and really test the feasibility of, of this. Can we di differentiate between muscle containing substrate um, and substrate that doesn't have muscles? Um, and so we set up a series of experiments where we varied the acoustic settings, the frequency and pulse length um, in a controlled environment with known substrate and muscle density. And we did this at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory um, where we constructed a sound absorbing tank. Um, and yes, this tank is lined with um, AstroTurf um, in order to minimize the, um, any sound reflecting off of the tank walls itself. This was a pretty large tank. It was two meters um, long by two meters deep and, and one meter um, wide. And we were able to take advantage of the data carriages or the instrumentation carriages at SAFL to help position and move our instrumentation around. So instead of a boat, we had this attached to um, a robotic carriage that can move our instrumentation around through the tank. Um, so within the tank, we had 10 centimeters of sediment, um, either sand, um, gravel, or mixed sediment, um, and varying um, levels of zebra muscle density, so high, medium, and low, um, and also had um, a test with, with native um, freshwater mussels. Um, and for all of these experiments, we varied, again, the sonar settings. So we varied the frequency and the pulse length. Um, and we had 12 different combinations of, of these settings. And what we get from all of that is, um, and I don't want you to focus too much on the details of this plot, but just sort of take a step back. And, and what we get from all that is, um, the distribution of backscatter for various, um, various um, sediment and mussel combinations for different um, sonar settings. Um, so here's our 12 different sonar settings. This, these are what are called violin plots. So they show the distribution of the backscatter. And what we're looking for are um, situations where we have um, differences in that distribution, which can help us differentiate between the different sediment types. Um, so basically, this is a large multivariate data set, and we're taking all of this information, um, plugging it into some machine learning algorithms or, or data-driven algorithms in order to find where the differences are um, in classifying these different types of substrate. And once we have these decision boundaries, um, we can arrive at a function that describes the likelihood of each substrate given the data. Um, and we can then determine the relative importance of each um, backscatter feature to the classification. And by backscatter feature, what I mean here is, is that combination of, of sonar settings. So what we ended up with in the laboratory experiments um, is not particularly surprising, which is that um, more data equals better accuracy. Um, so the more um, combinations of sonar settings we fed into our model, um, the better accuracy of the classification we had. And again, the classification is taking that acoustic backscatter information and, and predicting whether we have sand, gravel, um, or mixed in a um, with or without um, native or invasive mussels. What this translates to in the field um, is that each one of these combinations of settings would be an independent survey. So, for example, if we used all 12 combinations of, of settings, that would mean that you had to survey the same site 12 different times in order to get enough data in order to classify what the substrate is. 
Um, so that's one of the things that we're testing in the next phase um, is doing the same um, combinations of, of multi-beam sonar settings um, in the field to determine which ones are the most important and do we need all of them or can we reduce the number of surveys in order to um, be able to accurately classify our um, substrate and muscle, relative muscle coverage. So um, we're currently in phase two, um, and this is the field validation phase. So the goal of this phase is to develop data collection and classification methods that take into account this field variability. So we have a greater range of substrate types and a greater range of um, muscle densities, as well as things like um, vegetation that could be present in the field that could interfere with our ability um, to collect quality and multi-beam sonar data. And so what we did in this phase is we really targeted um, a wide range of these muscle densities and substrate types um, in two different water bodies. So we wanted high, medium, and low muscle density across a range of different um, substrate types, different sediment sizes, so sand, silt, rock and gravel, et cetera. Um, and so to do this, what we needed um, is some high resolution information about what um, the substrate type and muscle density is as well and be able to relate that to um, the multi-beam sonar data. So to do this, we set up a series of transects and each transect was um, 20 meters long um, and was broken into um, one meter quadrats on either side of our transect line. Um, at the end of the transects um, were uh, large metal garbage cans represented by the gray cylinders here. Um, and these garbage cans, while it seems odd, what they provided us with is a um, measurable object that is visible within the um, multi-beam sonar data that allows us to tie um, the coordinate system of the transect to the coordinate system, the highly accurate coordinate system of the multi-beam sonar. Um, and then these were attached to buoys that were visible at the surface. Um, so the way this went is we set up a transect, um, we verified it using our underwater ROV, um, and then we um, drove along this transect at varying distances from the transect using the multi-beam sonar and with different settings. Um, so that um, resulted in 36 different passes. So 12 different settings, times three different distances is 36 different passes with the multi-beam sonar. And then once that was done, our scuba diving team came in um, with their quadrats and measured the relative muscle um, coverage and the, the substrate type, as well as anything that might be um, any other notes that needed to be made about each quadrat. So our zebra mussel site um, for phase two was, was White Bear Lake. And we selected White Bear Lake because it had a range of depths and different substrate types as well as, as zebra mussel densities. Um, the small red lines that you can see on this map of White Bear Lake, those are the locations of our um, transects where we collected um, this simultaneous multi-beam sonar data and, and um, substrate and, and zebra mussel density information. Um, I think we had 24 different transects um, on White Bear Lake. And so we were really at, able to capture a large range of um, muscle densities and, and different substrate types. Our native mussel site was the St. Croix River. Um, and we selected this site because it, it gave us the ability, again, to get different types of substrates, specifically sand and gravel, um, and up to high native mussel densities within these sites. So um, high mussel densities in both sand and gravel, which is, is not necessarily um, which this site provided us um, the ability to do. The picture on the right here, um, just for, um, is a picture of a native mussel um, that's covered in zebra mussels. And, and this is really one of the um, big risks to the native mussels is the fact that the, the zebra mussels will actually um, colonize the, the native mussels themselves. Okay, so, um, as I said, when we set up our transect, we would verify our transect using our underwater ROV, um, remotely operated vehicle. Um, so these videos, which I hope are showing um, 
appropriately are, are just showing um, three examples across different types of substrate in White Bear Lake of, of what our ROV was able to show. Um, I named the ROV Roberta um, because when it's at the surface, it's kind of bobbing along. So a couple of things to point out here. While we get some great information here in White Bear Lake about the sort of typical substrate and, and relative muscle density using this video imagery, um, some things, there are some limitations to this alone. And, and one of them is that um, we weren't able to tell um, in the video, whether the muscle shells that you see there are alive muscles or are dead muscle shells. Um, and we also weren't able to, um, in the in the St. Croix where the visibility is far less, um, the, the view uh, from the ROV is, is fairly limited. So we could verify that the transect line looks like we expected it to, but we weren't able to get this um, information about what the muscle density is without our dive team. Okay, so um, this is just showing that we were indeed able to get um, information. So this is information that was collected by the dive team that shows that we did get a distribution of high, medium, and low zebra muscle density for various quadrats um, across different, different substrate types. Um, and again, here what we're recording is a, is a visual estimate of the percent coverage so from low, 0 to 10% um, muscle coverage up to high, um, 40 to 90% um, coverage by area of, of muscle density in, in two different quadrats here. On the St. Croix, um, we were focusing on sand and gravel sites, although we did get some information in some sandy, silty substrates. And, and we were focusing on low, um, so close to zero native muscles per square meter. Um, up to very high, which is 34 to 46 muscles per square meter. And in this case, our divers weren't measuring the percent um, area coverage of the native muscles, but what they were looking for are muscles that were protruding above, um, above the sediment surface. Um, and so as in this image here, so muscles that were sticking out and, and changing um, the roughness of the sediment surface. And um, to ensure that we had good information about areas that had with the same substrate um, and with and without the presence of mussels, um, for a number of quadrats in both sand and gravel in both sites, um, our dive team went back down and actually um, physically removed the mussels. And then the area was rescanned using the multi beam sonar so that we had information um, on the same substrate with um, and without the presence of mussels. So here's an example of some bathymetry data that was collected in White Bear Lake. Um, and the red lines in this image are showing the location of, of two of our transects. Um, and just to, to show you that this is what some of the, the raw um, or some of the point cloud data look like that was um, extracted from these multi-beam sonar surveys. And you can see that our, our garbage cans actually worked really well um, in order to give us those endpoints of our transect. So it's a, an object um, that is, is highly visible within the, the point cloud that um, can tell us, um, can give us a, a, a location of the end of our survey so that we can tie both the um, survey data, the scuba survey data together with the um, multi-beam sonar data. And again, here's another example. This is information along those um, one of those transects. And you can see the, the white lines indicate the boat passes. Um, so again, 36 total passes per transect line um, to meet these, um, these 12 combinations of frequencies um, and pulse lengths in, in the sonar settings. Um, so the figure on the left is showing all 36 passes and the figure on the right is showing um, those passes at different distances from um, the transect line. So basically right over the transect line offset a little bit and then offset a little bit more so that um, we get different angles of the sonar um, hitting our, our transect line. 
Okay, so at this point, um, much of this information, again, we just collected that this summer, um, and we just wrapped up our data collection in St. Croix about a month ago. Um, so at this point, we are not yet able to tell to say whether we um, what changes we needed to make in in the um, model that was developed in the laboratory and, and how that relates to what's in the field. Um, but we should be able to do that soon. Um, but we did, we were very careful when we were in the field to, to capture information in our scuba diving survey that can help tell us a little bit about how well um, the methods work or don't work in the field and, and to, to, um, to record some of the information about why or why not. So things that we expect may or may not be challenges would be things like mixed zebra mussel and native mussel um, populations. Um, which again were recorded by the scuba diving scuba divers in the field. Um, live versus dead shells. Um, we're not sure whether we'll get a different signal um, versus live or dead, um, but we did record that information. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we see with this methodology is the fact that um, oftentimes uh, mussels or zebra mussels will colonize vegetation um, and um, that can interfere with the signal that we're getting off the bed and or um, result in a large portion of, of mus the mussel population, which may or may not be accounted for in these methods. And so um, the presence of vegetation and the presence of zebra mussels on vegetation were also recorded by our, our survey team. Okay, so um, phase three, um, we'll start in the beginning of, of 2022. Um, and there are really two goals of phase three. The first is, is a full scale mapping. So at this point, um, we have laboratory data to help develop our um, classification model. And we have field, uh, quite a bit of field data from this summer to help develop our classification model. Um, but phase three will focus on, on actually mapping a large area and then checking the accuracy of um, that map um, using our scuba diving team and our, our ROV. Um, and this is a completely hypothetical example using, this is um, measured bathymetry from USGS um, from a completely different project, um, but in the same area, the St. Croix, um, where again, the, the, the map um, that we're able to develop would look something like this with a, a measured bathymetry um, overlain by this, the classification um, of various types of substrate. Is it medium, in this case, native mussels with sand? Is it low density native mussels with sand? Is it high density native mussels with sand or, or high density zebra mussels, et cetera? So these different class, a map of these substrate in different classifications overlain over the bathymetry. Um, and a big, the second goal um, of phase three is to help translate this research um, into practice. Again, this is, um, these are methods that have not yet been developed um, that we're in the process of developing. And, and so um, in order to make this available to others um, who have access to multi-beam sonars, we need to be able to translate this research into practice. So defining the limitations um, and challenges of the methods, um, vegetation and how to deal with it, whether that's looking at or doing surveys, surveys at key times of the year when vegetation is not present um, or some other way of dealing with the vegetation, um, quantifying what types of densities are detectable and, and what isn't, um, and comparing the um, cost and effort of these survey methods to other existing um, survey methods such as scuba, um, et cetera. Um, and pulling all of this information from all three phases together into guidance for field data collection and guidance for um, processing um, codes and procedures. So combined um, for management purposes, what this means is that um, it will be a tool that can help make monitoring efforts far more efficient and or collect information in a much larger spatial um, area than is what is currently available. Um, and this can help do things like target management activities. If you know um, where the muscles are and where the highest densities are, um, you can target your management activities appropriately. Um, it can also help researchers map 
muscle populations over time um, and or differentiate between invasive muscles and native muscles. So avoiding areas of, of high native muscle populations. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in so far. A reminder, um, as you're kind of pressing through the presentation and our conversation keeps rolling here over the next about 20 minutes, put your questions into the Q&A box so that we can get them in queue for Jess and her team to answer. Um, our first question that came in was, um, were all transects run at the same depth? And does depth affect the comparability of the roughness backscatter data? Um, The, the answer to the first is um, no, we intentionally did not run all transects at the same depth. Um, we tried to target different, um, different depths when we were setting the transects. And that, that's part of the reason for the large number of transects specifically, particularly in White Bear Lake, which is our zebra mussel site. <clears throat> and the second part of, about whether depth affects the comparability of the roughness and backscatter data and, um, I don't know if Matt is online, Matt Kaplinski is online, but I would say that um, yes, depth could have an effect because of the fact that the depth can affect the angle at which the, um, the sound waves hit the bed. And so that angle can affect um, the roughness and or backscatter data. Um, and there are ways to account for that, but that is one reason that we tried to get different depths within our data set. Yeah. Hey, Jess, can you hear oh, me? Hi. Matt? Hi. Hi. And you may uh, have a better answer than I did. No, that was great. Um, uh, one thing that I wanted to add um, was um, the uh, the distribution of the of the zebra mussels is um, they're a fairly they're fairly shallow. They're located in fairly shallow areas. Um, so over the depth range that, um, what is the depth range of like, how deep do they go, Jess, they go? Uh, you know, that's somewhat dependent on the water body, it, it, but you're yeah. absolutely correct in that in White Bear Lake um, in particular, both the, the sandy substrate and the cobbly substrate and the largest densities of zebra mussels were occurring at the, mostly at the shallower depths. Although at least one of the videos that I showed was um, at, about 20 feet with large rocks that were heavily colonized by zebra mussels. Right, and the, the, the depth affects, the, the resolution of the sonar um, is affected by the depth based on the, the configuration of the sonar beams themselves. Um, as the beam, the beam has a, um, an angular uh, configuration to it, so the deeper um, the beam, the, the sound, beam travels through the water column, the wider it gets. So um, in general, you could say that the resolution, um, the footprint of the beam that translates to the ability of um, what you can detect on the bed um, increases as you get deeper and deeper. But I will say, I will say that the depths over which um, we did our surveys. I believe the, the deepest uh, part we surveyed was like eight to 10 meters deep. Um, that's still pretty shallow for sonars. And the beam footprint, um, oh, off the top of my head, I may be wrong on the math that I'm doing on the fly, but um, the resolution of the beam footprint at a degree and a half at 10 meters is, is probably on the order of a couple centimeters versus with two to three meters, it's probably in the order of um, millimeters in width. Um, one point that I want to make, sorry, before we move on to the next question, just sort of building off of what Matt said there is that we're not, um, this isn't a method to detect individual muscles. This is a method to detect an area where there are muscles present. Um, so just to be very clear on that, it's not a magic, here's a muscle and here's a muscle, but it's a, in this area, we have a, a high or low or no density of muscles. So thank you. Yeah. 
Yes, so you could identify an area that has the muscles and then send in divers would be more, have a more detailed survey approach. Correct, that. yep, that would be one of the benefits of this method, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, um, and I think you we'll touched on this a little bit, but just to ask, to ask it a little more directly, um, could this method be used for the detection of zebra mussels in lakes that are not known to have them already, or is it more of a useful technology for lakes that are already infested? Um, so absolutely. I think that one thing that, that this could be used for is not just the detection of, of zebra mussels in lakes not known to have zebra mussels, but also um, to detect areas and map areas um, most likely to be colonized by zebra mussels. Um, so again, we can get a lot of information about depth and the various substrate types there. Um, and based on information we already know, kind of have a good idea of, of where you might expect to find um, zebra mussels. Um, I also, you know, I know in many lakes where, where you might pick up a mussel or two um, through villager sampling or, or through individual, um, like, one or two mussels on a dock, this could be a way to sort of find that reproducing mussel population is, is where is the source population that's starting to infest um, a lake that maybe previously didn't have them. So um, yes, um, I think there's going to be a limitation on how small of a population we can find. So we're probably not gonna be able to find one or two mussels, but if there's an area where there's a dense enough population, I think it could potentially we hope to be able to identify that. Um, the second question about the time and money needed to survey a lake, um, I think that depends on the lake um, and what size are we talking about. And um, that is really, that's a piece that we are including in our phase three is, is that cost benefit analysis of, of this compared to other survey methods. So um, I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, I don't really know what that would be, but that is something that we know is important to folks. Yeah, if I could, if I could add um, on that, uh, Jess, um, the uh, one thing that we are evaluating here um, is what combination of these different sonar settings works best for the detection of the substrate, and it um, it may be that um, we need a wide range of frequencies with a couple different uh, pulse lengths to do it, which in, in the case of the sonar we used would mean multiple passes um, and surveying these areas several times with that sonar system. They do, the sonar systems are available that are multi-frequency or multi-spectral they're called, um, which um, would be a cost saving effort uh, or uh, if you had that sonar, you could do one pass that um, outputs all a uh, range of frequencies on the fly. Um, so those, those are some of the things we're evaluating in this, uh, the project that we're, um, uh, the phase two part of this project right now. And, and I will say that I think that this is particularly one of those tools that as um, technology continues to improve, the cost will come down. Yeah. Um, the next question is, do you feel this would eventually be something local managers could use with more off-the-shelf equipment like low rents used for vegetation surveys? Um, the particular methods that we're working on now dealing with the acoustic backscatter are specific to this um, research grade multi-beam sonar. Um, I think that there may, it's, it's kind of, and Matt can jump in here too, but I think it's, it's basically kind of a different question as to whether we, you can use off the shelf um, sonar systems and, and the, the information you get from them is a bit different. Um, one thing I will say um, is that opportunistically, we took our off the shelf side scan sonar and collected information um, at the same time as we did with the, the multi-beam sonar for this study. So we, we have a data set, um, but, um, yeah, I don't know, Matt, if you have something to add to that. Yeah, the 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 difference between um, these uh, Laurents, the side scans, or even um, um, these low grade ones and the survey grade ones, the survey grade ones we used a a Norbit um, system, is that they collect um, the data that's called the acoustical backscatter, which is an um, 
which is the data that we use to apply these statistical methods and modeling um, to discriminate between the substrate types and the muscle densities. That information is not part of these uh, lower end, um, you know, the two to five thousand dollar range Lorentz um, type systems. So, I, a short answer to that question would be no. <laughs> um, and it, this is specifically looking at the backscatter information that only comes from those um, higher end survey grain grade uh, multi-beam systems. Just you mentioned that you um, had that side scan on the equipment. So you have that data set. Is that something that you're going to be analyzing as a part of this project? Or is that, do you have plans for that? Um, at this point, we, we have the information. And if we have the capacity, we'd like to, we may take a look at it. Um, it was just because we went to this large effort and we have all of this background survey information from the scuba diving team that it was a, a low cost and easy additional data set to collect. Yeah. Um, it is not within the scope of our current project, um, which wraps up by December. And, and I, I highly doubt we'll be able to do anything with it before then, but we have it. It's and there. there may, if I can jump in again here, there mm -hmm. may be um, the, the Lawrence, that side scan collects information that's um, the best way to think about it is that it's a, it's, it, um, it identifies the surface texture. So um, the, I suppose the way to, if there's a way to correlate the backscatter information that's um, discriminated through the bed substrates discriminated through these statistical techniques, to the texture of the surface, there may be a way to correlate those two. Um, and that would be pretty exciting to have those low cost systems available um, that would definitely um, expand the range of um, things. But um, that again is something that would be a big bonus. But by December, we're not quite sure that's gonna happen. Okay, so our next question is, do you use custom software to evaluate the sonar data? Yes. <laughs> um, Matt, you can jump in on that. Much of that information though is available through, or will be available through sources like GitHub, or at least the, the post-processing information. Yeah, the, the, the processing uh, pipeline is to use, um, we collected the data with um, the QPS software suite, which is um, um, used to edit the multi-beam sonar data and generate the, the backscatter mosaics. And once those backscatter mosaics are generated in the associated statistics, those are run through a processing package that's um, available a custom package that's available um, through GitHub at the moment, and then we'll be modifying it and um, hopefully putting out a better package. So it's it's both commercial packages and custom packages on the on the back end for the for the processing for the bed substrate classification. Those are typical commercial packages that anybody who's using multi beam sonar would already be using. Correct. Say that again, Jess. Uh, but that's a typical commercial package that if you already have the multi-beam sonar, that would be a usually oftentimes used with the multi-beam sonar. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And then Jess, you touched on this a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about um, the shift to three-dimensional and how this um, technology works when zebra mussels are on aquatic plants versus on yeah. substrate and how, how you're dealing with that in the study? So I think that's, again, one of those um, questions that we acknowledge that the, the um, 
the vegetation is there and that the zebra mussels are colonizing the vegetation. Um, within the scope of this study, um, we are not quantifying or trying to quantify the zebra mussels on the vegetation. Um, but I, I think it's, it's more going to relate to how do we best give guidance for doing these kind of surveys and, and how do you deal with the vegetation, knowing that that's a potential issue. Um, it may be an idea for future research down the line, but we have a complicated enough problem already. Um, <laughs> yes. So, okay. Um, and then another question, somewhat related to how this would be implemented for management. Um, your study is looking at Minnesota lakes. Um, how would this, if this technology works and is something that could be kind of put out at scale for other managers? Um, would you need to recalibrate in places outside of Minnesota for different native species or different substrate types? Or is the kind of baseline data, the baseline that you're establishing transferable? Um, again, I can let Matt jump in with some of his previous exper experience, but I'll let Matt jump in. Yes. Um... The data is transferable to other places because the, the discrimination of the bed um, substrate uses ground truth information that's specific to that water body. So you would, uh, you, you, let's say you find a place that's sand and has no mussels. Um, that is confirmed by, um, you identify from ground truthing information that in fact, this area with a specific um, backscatter intensity is sand with no mussels and, and so on down the line, high density mussels on sand. Um, you confirm that with ground truth data that's specific to the site. So the techniques um, are transferable to other water bodies in other places um, because it's all site specific. Okay. Meaning it's calibrated to itself by ground truth data. So you can, if you have good ground truth data, you can calibrate whatever sonar you collect, wherever you collect it with the information on the bed. Um, and just a, a quick note on the ground truth data is, is we collected a lot of information um, using transects um, for, for this phase two study, but the, the typical ground truthing data would not be anywhere near that level of, of data collection. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, all of the ground truth data that I've worked up with up to this project in, in, um, consists mainly of um, imagery of the bed in different places. Um, in this case, we have transects um, that have all kinds of information on it. Um, so this, this ground truth data is a whole order of magnitude different than anything I've worked with before to calibrate the, the backscatter. And can either of you speak to, you know, this technology, is it being used to identify other species other than zebra mussels or is this a unique application of it in this project? Not necessarily just mussels, but, mm -hmm. you know, what is this kind of technology used for in other applications? Um, so again, Matt can, Matt can speak to this because he's been involved in these projects, but it's being used to, to classify um, substrate so whether you're talking about sand, gravel, rock, et cetera, um, and then also the presence or absence of vegetation, um, yeah. but not yet for, for mussels or other um, benthic organisms. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's uh, quite a few studies out there um, that use the uh, bed classification, the, the bed substrate type, um, and presence and absence of different uh, vegetation densities to translate that information with, with um, other observations into habitat mapping. 
so you can have habitat suitability models based on all this information that's a couple steps away. So you use the bed classification along with um, other ecological data to develop, to develop habitat models. And those are the um, only other things that I am aware of that this has been used for. And it's pretty unique to identify muscle densities with this. That's great, that's exciting. <laughs> um, and that brings us to 11 o'clock. Um, so I, we are gonna close down questions here, um, but if you have questions that you either didn't get a chance to get in the Q&A or pop into your head later in the day, um, feel free to reach and offer this up. Jess, reach out to Jess at her email address there on the slide. Um, or you can always follow up with maserg at umn.edu and we can connect you with the researchers as well to help get those answers, questions answered. Um, so thank you, Jess and Matt, for being here and to your team for this presentation. Um, we are gonna take about a 15 minute break here and the next session in this web room will begin at 11.15 and it is identifying genes for zebra muscle control. Um, so take a little break and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Thank you, Jess. Um, to kind of kick us off, you touched on this a little bit um, in your presentation, but could you, um, this question came up earlier as well of, is this a method or a technology that can be used for um, detecting new zebra muscle infestations and kind of what scale would they need to be at to be um, picked up by the sonar? Um, yeah, so at this point, we don't know what the sort of minimum detectable density is, um, but there's probably a limitation on that. But um, the scale at which we're processing our um, backscatter mosaics or the backscatter data um, for this project um, is on the order of 25 square centimeters. And Matt, you can jump in <laughs> um, or a quarter, quarter square meter, right? Or quarter meter by quarter meter squared. Um, anyway, so we're not is we're not talking about detecting individual muscles, but the the relative muscle density over an area. Um, and then, what is the investment in in this understanding? This is still kind of early; you're still developing this method. But um, mm -hmm. what's the investment of time and money that would need be needed to survey a lake? Yep. Um, so. Acknowledging that this is a really important component um, or a really important question, um, that is part of our phase three to dig into that question in more detail of, of um, how, what does it cost and what is the time commitment to developing this kind of um, uh, monitoring methods. Um, I will say that um, one of the things we're, we're um, working on figuring out in phase two is how many surveys do we need to do? Um, how can we, we optimize and limit the number of, of those pulse length and frequency combinations in order to get enough information to accurately classify the sediment and muscle density? Um, so question just came in of, mm -hmm. does the sonar differentiate muscles attached from something like woody debris, like a branch or a log that's in the bottom of a water body versus on the lake bottom? Um, <laughs> So we're looking at classification of sort of a statistical analysis of the backscatter that's returned. Um, so we're not, we're not looking at say what's happening on, a, on an individual log or what's happening with an individual muscle. Um, so if there were a large area that was covered in woody debris and if it was covered or not covered with zebra mussels, then, then yes, you might get a different kind of return off of that. But, um, that's not the situation that we're targeting at this point. Okay. Um, and then I don't know, you... Matt, are you here? Do you have any input on that? Yes, I am here, Jess, hi. Hi. Um, at this point, um, we are targeting um, the lake and river bottom only vegetation and um, uh, anything sort of sticking off 
the bed of the surface of the water body is going to be edited out of the data set before creating the backscatter mosaics themselves. Mm -hmm. um, something to point out here is that we're not proposing um, uh, that this method is going to tell you exactly how many muscles are in an area, but more what are the relative densities. Um, so if you have an area that has a lot of zebra mussels and you have a piece of wood there, um, presumably there'd be a lot of zebra mussels on the substrate surrounding the wood as well, or could be. Okay. Have you had any discussions um, in regard to combining your sonar measured density project approach with actual control projects utilizing pesticides like copper sulfite? Um, We have not gone down that path yet, but there's the opportunity to do so, particularly with the phase three mapping. Um, and I guess I should say too, um, Jess, this project will be continued into a new phase and um, Jess will be giving a presentation in the next session as part of the lightning talks about that phase three too, if anybody wants to catch that, yeah. Um, I will say though that the, the talk for the next session is very similar to a shortened version of the talk that I just gave. <laughs> okay. So um, you should tune in to see the other new projects, but you may see some replication. Um, Dan. Oh, you're on mute, Dan. Hear you. Nope. Okay, we left. <laughs> um, well, well, Dan takes clear that we can come back to this question too if he can get his mic working. Um, but Jess, could you speak a little bit about um, the, eventually if this is something that managers could use with off the shelf equipment? That question has come up in the past too of um, mm -hmm. what's different about this kind of technology and, and why is it so unique in this setting? Yeah. Um, so there's there's two big differences. Um, the primary big difference in terms of what we're doing with this information is the the backscatter mosaic. It's this detailed information about the um, the backscattering of sound that is not available with the off the shelf um, side scan sonars. Um, the other component that is useful or um, that we Took advantage of is, is the very high resolution GPS positioning of the instrumentation. So we can create high resolution maps because we have high accuracy um, positioning of the instrumentation. Thank you. Um, and then another question for you is just how you talked a little bit about the calibration of the equipment to the different substrates, um, but how can you just speak a little bit about how that would work in different settings with different native species or different kinds of substrates down the road? Maybe substrates that aren't, they're found in different parts of the country or different places. Um, Matt, do you want to jump in again here? Or do you, would you like me to take this? Um, you know, I can speak to this. Um, the, the techniques used here are, um, portable to other water bodies. Mm -hmm. um, it uses the, the backscattered um, <clears throat> intensities from the sonar surveys in combination with ground truth data. So if you went to Missouri or here in Arizona and surveyed a water body, um, it would work the exact same way. So that these techniques have been used um, on other rivers and lakes um, all over the place, even in the ocean. But for substrate and vegetation classification, not muscle classification. Egg, egg, yes, exactly. The muscle, the muscle uh, identification is new and we're encouraged by the laboratory experiments and excited to um, run these data from White Bear Lake and St. Croix through the, the algorithms and map out some muscle densities and substrate types. 
Thanks, Matt. So I think, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I was just uh, gonna make a comment about the copper sulfate question uh, that came. Part of that will depend on whether we can actually differentiate between live and dead zebra mussels. So uh, we should find that out as we start looking at the data. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Could, could one of you speak a little bit more to that about what the challenge is with alive versus dead? Is it the shape that's different or what's kind of what's the challenge there? Um, yeah, so as, as I look at it, well, the, so for the native mussels, it's pretty easy that a live native mussel will look something like this. And if it's dead, you might have just a shell that's sitting like this. And so both the shape and the density are somewhat different. Um, and the same thing would be true for the zebra mussels, but at a smaller scale. So the roughness, the surface roughness that's created by a pile of dead shells is probably different than the surface roughness that's created by a bunch of attached live zebra mussels. Um, whether that difference is enough to be picked up in, in our data or not, we, we don't know that yet. Okay. Yeah. And you know, we talk a lot about zebra mussels in the state as one of kind of the primary invasive species that I think people have an awareness of and concern about. Um, but quagga mussels are also a concern in a lot of places. Um, mm -hmm. Would this kind of technology work for those two? It would, can you explain kind of what that process would be like for a different invasive mussel species? Um, as Matt pointed out um, just a second ago, I think the process would be very similar in that um, the, the sort of general process of, of how the data are collected um, would remain the same. Um, it would just rely on some, some good ground truth information. Um, I also suspect I, quagga mussels and zebra mussels are fairly close in, in shape and size, and I'm not sure that this is going to be something that we would be able to differentiate between those two species. Um, our native mussels and the zebra mussels are, are very significantly different in shape and size. Um, could you talk about, we have a little bit of time, could you um, speak just a little bit about kind of the phase three and what the hope for that research is and kind of, um, you know, how, if, if this is a successful method for mapping muscles, mm -hmm. um, what would that rollout look like for managers? We can project out a little bit <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, so the, the first, like I said, there's two main goals of phase three. The first, the first goal is, is this full scale mapping. And, and so um, that part of the project is, is the sort of full field scale demonstration of, of the methods and, and, and a verification and a quantification of, of the error involved. Um, so that alone would be a, a product that would be available in the water bodies in which we um, do that mapping that would be available to our managers um, and for, for folks that were interested in, in what the um, native or zebra mussel populations looked like. Um, the second part, um, the sort of uh, the documentation and, and guidance, um, part of that process would be the, um, or part of that second goal would be the, the um, developing the guidance for how do you do the field data collection. Um, so tips and tricks and, and recommendations for how to best collect this information to, to um, you know, hedge your bets in terms of being successful. Um, and the other part would be the, the documentation um, the codes and the documentation for how you post-process um, these acoustic backscatter mosaics um, and turn those mosaics into a, a classification um, of, of the substrate and, and relative muscle density. So it looks like that's the end of our questions. Um, so we can wrap up just a few minutes early here. Um, thank you, Jess and Dan and Matt for being on both this morning and this afternoon, appreciate it. Um, if anybody in the audience has more questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Jess has her contact information up. Otherwise you can always email macerc at umn.edu and we can connect you with the research team as well.
Um, but thank you so much to all of you for being here and we'll break and give folks a few extra minutes to get up and start to get ready for the next session.
Thank you, Gretchen and Steve. Um, so a reminder to attendees, drop your questions in the Q&A box and I'll start reading those out for our presenters. Um, to start us off, a question for you, um, is hybrid milfoil abundance tracked in the lake after your Eurasian water milfoil infestation? And what do we know about hybrid impacts compared to Eurasian water milfoil? Could you take a look at that? Uh, so this sounds like a great question for our plant ecologist team who is not presenting here today. So I, um, I'm sure that hybrid is tracked in these surveys, well, I'm pretty sure, um, but we have not looked at it in this study at all. Okay. Could you speak a little more, Gretchen, to the, the survey data that you used for this project? Um, where did that come from? Did your team collect that? Is that a compilation of data? Can you just give us a little the more? The plant time? survey? Yeah. The plant survey, yeah. So yeah. Um, we did not collect it. Um, <laughs> many, many people have collected it and done lots of work over many years to, to do this. Um, and Mike Verhoeven, who's a PhD candidate, um, who is collaborating on this project has worked to compile and bring these data together from multiple sources. So um, the DNR has collected some individual, um, like lake management consultants have collected some, I believe some citizen scientists have collected some watershed organizations. Um, so he's brought together all those surveys that have used the same methodology, so point intercept methodology, which is go out to this grid of points on the lake and throw a rake and pull it in and identify the plants that are on there. Um, he has compiled all those data into a really powerful database that we are using um, as our, our raw data for this work. Thank you. Um, Next question is, the attendee is curious to hear your thoughts on how something like zebra mussels might impact property values. Zebra mussels make water clearer, which might make property values increase, theoretically, but have negative impacts on some recreation, which might have a negative impact on property values. Either of you comment on that? I'll start, but um, Gretchen certainly uh, fill in. Um, so uh, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Chris. The, um, Certainly, we, we do know from other work that when um, property value, excuse me, when water quality improves, that, that does have a positive impact on, on property value. So there, there are some studies both from Minnesota and elsewhere that, um, that, that show that effect. Um, of course, that's not all zebra mussels do, right? So zebra mussels, you know, clog intake and they, they get on boats and docks and, and cause all kinds of other things. So um, you know, there's going to be a negative impact on that. Um, I have not looked at the, the studies um, of, of zebra mussels and property values, but um, I'm, I just, uh, in the interim, when you pop that question on, I, you know, got on the internet to see, I think there are some, and um, so give me a few minutes and maybe I can find out. <laughs> Yeah, I think that would be an interesting one um, to think about. I mean, the human psychology behind changes in property values, because as Steve says, uh, the increase in water clarity is known to improve, like cause is associated with increases in property values. But zebra mussels are a widely known um, negatively associated species. So I'm not quite sure how those two factors would play out. I would add that they're also much like um, in our case with Eurasian water milfoil, I think zebra mussels are invading our more our most popular lakes, um, lakes that are popular for multiple reasons, um, including their walleye fisheries and their size and all this stuff. And so um, it, it's not entirely clear what I would predict, but maybe Steve is doing a lit review for us that he can uh, inform us. There are some papers out there, but unfortunately, at least um, they, they, they're not making it easy on you to say, you know, here, here's what the impact is. It's, a, it's not popping out in the abstract, but anyway, I'll keep looking. Um, Steve, could you speak a little bit? This came up in the first session. I think it's um, helpful to kind of clarify too. The question of if tax, um, property taxes are being impacted um, and how that relates to property values and the impact of AIS. Yeah, so, um, you know, 
in most places, property taxes are, of course, a percentage of the, um, of the value of the property. So if, if property values are dropping, then that would have an impact on the intake of, of property taxes. Um, you know, it's um, earlier in a question in this morning's session, you know, somebody said, well, are, um, are these showing up in assessed values, which of course is really what the property rolls, property taxes are based on. So, um, and, I, and I don't know the answer to that part of it, you know, to what extent is it actually showing up? I mean, there should be some, there is supposed to be relationship between sales values and assessed values, but sometimes there can be a lag. Um, so a question here from one of the attendees, um, reading between the lines maybe a little bit, is your intent to get Minnesota citizens more engaged in AIS prevention through the pocketbook, um, i.e. property values? Gretchen, uh, I, <laughs> I can uh, So, I mean, the first part, I, I, don't, I don't think that you have to read between the lines totally to say, I mean, so far, the analysis done by Steve and team shows there is a negative impact on property values. It's variable, and we're trying to understand that variability, for example, the metro versus non-metro, um, and maybe not quite as large as what's been shown in other slightly smaller scale studies. Um, as for our intent, um, I'd say our intent is to understand whether there is, I mean, this effect on economic values, the impact of EWM on property value has been documented in these other places. Our intent was to see what if we do a statewide assessment in Minnesota, do we see that same result? Um, and I think, you know, understand bigger picture, quantifying and understanding impacts of invasive species, I think can help us all make better decisions about how we want to invest our time and resources, um, if we, where we want to prevent them and why it's important to an individual. Property values might be one reason. I also do a lot of work on you know, walleye and ecological impacts. Um, that might be another important thing to understand. So I'll, I'll jump in and I mean, my motivation in doing lots of these kinds of studies, not, not just this, but I do a lot of work on um, Various, you know, various ecosystem services. So it could be recreation, it could be, um, you know, the value of having cleaner water, um, and, and so forth. And my motivation is that oftentimes, you know, unlike things that are bought and sold in markets, which have readily available prices, and we know we can see what their their values are, many of the things related to the environment just don't have prices, and so you know, they 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 oftentimes are invisible. And, um, uh, and, and invisible, not just, you know, to us buying and selling things as consumers, but, you know, to, to public policy. And so, in, you know, an informed public policy should actually have, you know, all of the costs and the benefits of various actions. So, you know, to the extent that there are large costs associated with this and we can show what those are, I think that, um, you know, that would call for more preventative actions to prevent spread. Um, and, you know, but it's, it is looking at, you know, really what are the consequences of, of, these, of these actions and, you know, are, are there large costs associated with it? That's a great answer, thank you. Um, the next one is how did you differentiate between the differences in property values due to water quality versus EWM? In other words, how do you know your property values decrease wasn't related to water quality instead of EWM or both? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and sort of anything, you know, the, the hard part in the statistical analysis here is isolating the effect of EWM from other things that are happening um, through time. So if there's um, systematic changes in water quality that are happening in this time, it may confound um, the effect of, of, uh, of, you know, of, of the EWM invasion. Um, we are controlling for um, a lot of things, however, because you know, we do have, uh, for example, we, we, we have values going through time. So if there's a, um, a systematic trend in water quality through time, we're gonna be picking that up. Um, 
we also on the you know like the, the the repeat sales i mean we do have for example repeat sales on lakes that aren't invaded so we're controlling for a lot of the housing values and repeat sales on houses that are invaded and so you know there it really is trying it, it, you know, there are fewer things that are shifting over time so that are going to be able to confound it but i can't rule out the fact that there aren't other things that are kind of shifting systematically in time that may be happening coincident with um, EWM invasion, but um, I don't know, Gretchen, you know, I, I haven't seen water quality trends um, that would match up well with the same with EWM trends, but um, maybe there are. Yeah, I think that would be uh, because of the statistical methods that we're using, I think the, the biggest opportunity for maybe confounding those things would be if there's a water quality change associated in particular with lakes that get invaded, that kind of happens concurrently with that. Um, and I don't, I don't know that there, there is, but um, yeah, we can't say for sure that it's not caused by something else, but we do our best to control for those things. Thanks for that. And just to clarify, um, in your study, invasion is defined as presence absence of EWM, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We would we um, would love to do this on the basis of like um, you know percentage abundance or percentage coverage. Um, as we said, it it just unfortunately we don't have as many lakes where we have that data, and when we have that data, it's not like through time. Um, so it's it's much harder to then uh, match that up with the with the property values and the changes. I know this came up in the first session too, but related to this, that any treatment of EWM isn't accounted for too. It is just that presence absence of the species. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um. Could you speak a little bit to what degree can risks for individual lakes either be calculated for initial invasion or progression and how reliable those progressions might be, projections might be? Yeah, so we can take the, um, the ecological models that we've built that predict the probability of a lake being invaded and the sort of predicted abundance associated with those lake characteristics. We could do that for individual lakes. Um, I always caution with this kind of model that they're they're most useful, I think, on a sort of broader scale because we can quantify their accuracy and their uncertainty on in terms of uh, across multiple lakes. And when you drill down into an individual lake, um, there's it's not so much about probability. It's about you know, did you get it right or did you get it wrong? So it's either right or it's wrong for an individual lake. Did it get invaded? Um, but we can say something about is this you know higher risk or lower risk than average, and how is that risk likely to change under future climate conditions? That I think um, you know, like any predictions under future scenarios, should be taken with a grain of salt. Of we don't know for sure what's going to happen in the future, but we can maybe use this to inform some of our decision making and um, depending on our risk tolerance, kind of what we want to do with that. So we have another question related to kind of the transfer of this, these learnings to other species. Um, and the question is, would you consider looking at property value decreases in curly leaf pondweed infestations considering curly leaf can have large impacts on water quality as well. Um, I'll just say, I mean, the, the the technique that we're using, and now that we've got you know the property value data there, um, so on the kind of property value side, we we could do that. Um, we would have to have, you know, the, the the really nice thing for me on this project is working with Gretchen and the team, you know, where, where they've assembled all of this great information on um, EWM. So we'd have to have that information also on the um, these other other uh, invaders. But in principle, it, you know, if you have that information, then yes, by all means, we could, we could do that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, we do have that information on curly leaf pondweed from these same surveys. And 
our experience working on this project has been, we got access to this Zillow database, which is a beast of a monster to deal with, uh, but contained you know, millions and millions and millions of records. Um, and the work that the economics team has done to kind of wrangle that and make that a plot, like identify the lakeshore properties and all the things that we now have that data set that we could yeah, explore other questions related to lakeshore properties and other impacts of other invasive species. And you may have mentioned this in your presentation, but can you just kind of highlight why uh, Eurasian water milfoil was selected as the species of study? For this one? Uh, why was it selected? Uh, well, because we had the plant database in hand. Um, mm -hmm because we had, we were interested in looking at, um, well, I guess on both sides, the, the climate change question, you know, we had a ecological basis for thinking that warmer temperatures might change the distribution of this species, given that it has a temperature associated with growing and, and all that. Um, and on the economic side that we had seen these property value changes documented in other studies, but that most of them were relatively small scale and hard to know how they would apply to, you know, the entire state. So there was sort of a, a basis for it already we wanted to build on, as science does. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Well, that brings us to three o'clock. So I am going to cut off our discussion here. Um, but if anybody else in the audience has further questions, um, feel free. Gretchen had her contact information up. Steve, I think you did too. Um, otherwise, always feel free to email maysirk at umn.edu and we would be happy to help answer some of those questions and connect you with the team. Um, Gretchen and Steve, thank you again for your presentation and the discussion. Um, our next presentation will be starting at 3.15 and here in this room, the presentation will be identifying genes for zebra mussel biocontrol. Um, so go ahead, take a little break and we will see you back in about 15 minutes. Thank you both. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.
All right, welcome everyone um, to our final presenter session of the showcase this year. You are in web room number three, and the talk that we have queued up for us right now is Identifying Gains for Zebra Muscle Biocontrol. It's gonna be presented by Dr. Daryl Gohl and Dr. Scott Valentine. Um, just a reminder, as you've been hearing with all of these presentations to drop your questions in the Q&A box. Um, any, all questions are good. We are usually able to hit all of them. Um, so don't be shy about asking for clarification on anything in the presentation, or if you just have kind of general questions about application to your experience or your lake, um, we want to hear from you to help with that discussion at the end of the session today. So go ahead and drop your questions in that Q&A box um, anytime during the presentation, and I'll be helping to moderate that conversation after the presentations wrap up. Um, so with that, I am going to invite Daryl and Scott to turn on their video um, and introduce themselves so that we can get started with their presentation. All right. Uh, thank you, Corey. I think we'll just introduce ourselves as we're speaking. Um, so I'm Daryl Goal, and uh, I'm going to be telling. I'm going to be starting out today and presenting together with Scott. Um, and we'll tell you about this project that we've been doing, uh, using information from the zebra mussel genome to try to identify genes for zebra mussel biocontrol. Um, so just as an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to start out by telling you about uh, our previous project sequencing the zebra mussel genome and how that's helping to inform the, the work in this current project. And then, and then I'm going to tell you about the approach that we've been taking to try to man manipulate gene expression in zebra mussels. This is a technique called RNA interference. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we're taking the information in the genome and trying to kind of prioritize and identify uh, promising candidate genes for potential um, uh, knockdown with these RNAi tools. And then I'll hand things off to Scott, and he's going to tell you a little bit about the strategies and approaches that we're using to try to optimize delivery of these RNAi reagents to zebra mussels, and then also some of the work we've been doing over this past summer in the Maser Containment Lab, developing phenotypic assays um, to study the effects of, of RNA knockdowns in zebra mussels. So I've got uh, photos here of the entire team. So we've been working closely with Dr. Mike McCartney, uh, who is one of, uh, one of the leaders of the Zero Muscle Genome Project. Um, he's continuing to contribute to this current project. Uh, and then also, um, there's been a lot of work done on this project by Lindsay Gengelbach and, and Margaret Donovan, uh, two uh, scientists in the, in the University of Minnesota Genomics Center. So uh, I lead the University of Minnesota Genomic Center's Innovation Lab. Uh, we work on applying genetic and genomic tools to a wide variety of problems, and I've just listed out some of the um, things that we've worked on in recent years. Um, but one of our large projects has been uh, to sequence the zebra mussel genome, and then uh, now this fall-on project to, to try to use that information in, in informing biocontrol efforts. So the zebra mussel genome project was a really large team effort. Uh, so I, I led sort of the technical team and then the scientific team was, was led by Dr. Mike McCartney um, from Maserk. And uh, you know this project involved the efforts of a very large number of scientists uh, within the UMGC, within Maserk, but also within the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute who contributed to the assembly and annotation of the genome. Um, and also some external collaborators from the NIH, uh, the University of Toronto, and a company called Phase Genomics. Um, this project was funded by a previous MACERC uh, research project grant, and it's really laid the groundwork for what we're doing um, in this current project. So just to tell you a little bit about how we um, went about sequencing and assembling the genome, um, this project really took advantage of uh, an array of uh, diverse technologies for DNA sequencing that we have available to us in the University of Minnesota Genomics Center. Uh, we made use of a, a relatively new technique uh, called long read sequencing um, that allowed us to really get a super high quality, um, very contiguous and complete assembly of the zebra mussel genome. Um, we also incorporated uh, an even newer technique called HiC um, that allowed us to really uh, uh, 
get, get, get a very contiguous assembly of the genome. Um, in addition to the, the sequencing and, and kind of assembling the genome, we also uh, acquired some functional information in the context of this project. Um, so we, we dissected a number of tissues, um, such as the mantle, which is in the, the, the um, tissue that is involved in shell formation, um, the gill, and, and some other tissues, um, and then looked at gene expression. We were able to map that data to the genome data. And that helped us both improve our, our um, annotation of the genome and you know, kind of our understanding of where the genes are. Um, but it also gave us a, a map of what was expressed in each of these different tissues. Um, and so the, the individual that was used to sequence the genome came from the Duluth Harbor. Um, so this is a sort of a, um, summary or a, a summary of that genetic map of zebra mussels. Um, it shows the 16 chromosomes or the 16 genomic scaffolds that we got from the DNA sequencing. And um, th this matched the previous karyotyping efforts where it was shown that zebra mussels had 16 chromosomes. So this gave us some confidence that we had uh, done a good job in, in assembling this genome. We had the right number of pieces. Um, and this genome, uh, you know, aside from being useful for these biocontrol efforts, it also filled in a really big gap in the sequence tree of life. So zebra mussels are actually over 450 million years diverged from the next most closely related sequence genome. Uh, just to give some context, this is about the evolutionary divergence between human and cartilaginous fish like manta rays. So this is a, a huge, um, this was a huge gap and a huge blind spot in our understanding of the tree of life. And the zebra mussel genome is going to be very scientifically important in filling in that information. So uh, we announced the genome sequence uh, about two years ago. Um, and this was uh, the headline in the Star Tribune at the time that it was announced. And it caused a bit of uh, consternation among the, the group that did the sequencing assembly, just with the ambiguous wording of the title. But, um, but this was really the goal of the, the project, was to, um, now that we have the information of the genome in hand, um, to think about how we could use that to, um, to, to control zebra mussel populations. Uh, however, we had, a, we had another challenge. In, in addition to just getting that genetic and, and genomic information, um, there's also the challenge that we can't grow zebra mussels and, and propagate them in the lab. So, so we can take them into the lab and grow them for a period of time, but getting them to spawn and reproduce and, and sort of establish a culture generation over generation. Um, is ironically very difficult, um, given how well they propagate in, in lakes and rivers. Um, there is an ongoing project uh, led by Ben Minerick from the Minnesota Zoo, who's been working on um, trying to establish conditions uh, in which you could reliably grow and propagate zebra mussels in the lab. And you know it's possible that we'll benefit from that in, in the future. Um, but for right now, uh, that, that remains a barrier. And so, certain tools that, that involve um, making heritable germline mutations, like the CRISPR tools that Mike Spansky's group is using and other organisms, um, aren't really an option in zebra mussels at this point. Um, so we needed to develop a strategy that didn't involve uh, creating heritable genetic manipulations in zebra mussels. So we turned to an approach called RNA interference. Uh, this is a technique that was initially, initially reported in the nematode worm C. elegans. Um, where it was discovered that if you inject double-stranded RNA targeting a C. elegans gene, um, you can actually knock down the expression of that gene or reduce the expression of that gene. And importantly, the researchers that discovered this, who received the Nobel Prize for this work, um, found that they could also, in addition to injecting the double-stranded RNA, they could also feed the C. elegans uh, bacteria that, that express the double-stranded RNA. So this provided a really convenient way of, of delivering these RNAi constructs to C. elegans. Um, subsequent to that initial work in, in the worms, RNAi has been found to be a very versatile mechanism for um, silencing gene expression in a wide variety of different organisms. Uh, this includes flies, uh, some examples here from planaria, and importantly from oysters, another bivalve. Um, where this technique has been shown to work. 
And interestingly, the, the FDA has just approved, just in the last couple of years, has approved the first RNA interference-based therapeutic for use in humans. So this is a, a technique that, that works across a very wide range of organisms. Um, and it's thought to have, uh, sort, sort of be a ancient antiviral defense mechanism. So typically RNA doesn't exist in double-stranded form in cells or rarely exists in double-stranded form in cells. Um, but there are a number of viruses that have double-stranded RNA genomes. And so uh, it's, it's thought that this, this system may have evolved as sort of innate immunity against these double-stranded RNA viruses. And there's a whole machinery inside uh, cells that recognizes double-stranded RNA, dices it up uh, into smaller pieces, um, and then uses those pieces to search the rest of the cell for RNA that has homology to that sequence, which it then degrades or silences. And so in essence, what we're trying to do in this project is using this uh, RNAi machinery to trick the zebra mussels into mounting a, a response against and silencing their own genes. Um, so uh, just to make this a little more concrete, uh, this is the actual approach that we take to, to, to make and deliver these RNA interference constructs. So first we take a target gene from zebra mussels uh, or a piece of a target gene from zebra mussels and we insert it into a, a small uh, circular DNA sequence called a plasmid. Um, and that plasmid is then inserted into a bacteria that um, can express uh, the, the target gene, a double-stranded version of the target gene at very high levels. So we can induce double-stranded RNA production in this bacteria, and then we can feed these bacteria to zebra mussels. Um, and then once we've done that, we can start to look for phenotypes. And these might be visible phenotypes where we've you know, changed some visible feature of the zebra mussels, slowed their growth. Um, it might be physiological measurements of you know, how, how quickly they can filter things out of the media. Um, or we can actually look at molecular readouts as well. Uh, so we can just look at the mRNA of the gene that we're targeting and, and determine whether or not the introduction of these double-stranded RNAs have been successful in reducing the expression of that gene. Um, so we'll be, we'll be um, taking all of those approaches to try to characterize the success of, these, of, of delivering these RNAi constructs into zebra mussels. So with the genome, what we essentially have is a catalog of all of the genes in the zebra mussel. Uh, and the, the difficulty is that this is a very large catalog. So the zebra mussel genome is almost 2 billion letters long. That's on the scale of the size of the human genome. It's about ha roughly half the size of the human genome. Um, this, if you were to print it all out, would be equivalent to about 600 copies of Tolstoy's War and Peace. And there are about 68,000 predicted genes. So this is a lot of information to wade through and, and to try to figure out where to start and what targets to, to try to go after. Um, so, so after some work of um, kind of looking at looking through this information and using, you know, computationally looking through this information um, and using some of the uh, experiments that we've done previously, looking at gene expression in different tissues, um, such as the mantle or or um, looking at gene expression in response to different conditions like uh, thermal stress. Um, we, we've created a, an initial list of about 150 high value targets that we think um, based on their, their expression, based on uh, their inferred functions, we think are going to be um, targets that, that are high value for um, trying to knock down and trying to induce phenotypes in zebra mussels. Um, another set of these genes are the Bissell thread genes, so the genes that form the attachment fibers. Um, we actually think we have probably the complete catalog of all of the genes that are necessary to make those attachment fibers um, from the genomic information. And, and so th those you know, obviously represent high value candidates that we can go after and try to see if we can uh, reduce their ability to attach to surfaces, for instance. So we, we, you know, we, we also, um, even, even not having that list of 150 genes is quite a lot to wade through and quite a lot, of, a lot to, to test. Um, so we actually did some further culling of that list to try to 
you know, kind of get it down to a reasonable number to test in our first batch of experiments. Um, and we used a few additional criteria. So one of those criteria were, was that the gene have conserved essential function. Um, so uh, we, we looked for genes that were absolutely required for life, for survival in a wide variety of organisms. So mammals, worms, flies, fish. And we, we found a collection of genes that we thought that, that, are, that are involved in basic cell biological processes um, like transcription or, or DNA replication or repair that, uh, that, that um, we think have a very high chance of being essential for survival in zebra mussels. So an example of one of the genes uh, shown on the top here, this is uh, RPABC5. It's a component of the RNA polymerase II complex. So this is basically the, the complex of proteins that turns genes on in cells. So for any gene to be expressed, it needs to have this protein. And you can see that this is a alignment of that this gene sequence from flies, worms, mice, and zebra mussels. And you can see this particular gene is extremely highly conserved. Um, only a few small changes across this, these vast uh, uh, divergent organisms. Um, and so, you know, we think that this is, you know, if we, if we can knock down this gene, there's a high probability that we will cause a phenotype in, in zebra mussels. Um, a lot of genes don't look like this. Or a lot, most genes have much less conservation. In a way, those might be better targets in the long run because they'll be more specific. Um, but for this first round of testing, we're, we're just really trying to see, can we get a phenotype? Um, these kinds of highly conserved genes are, are um, we think will be really useful. Um, we also wanted the genes that were single copy in the genome. So, you know, not a gene that had duplicated or, or had multiple copies spread throughout the different chromosomes. Um, and then we wanted genes that had rapid assays for, for um, telling whether or not they had a, a, an effect. So these are mostly genes that are involved in either viability, survival, you know, do the, are the zebra mussels alive or dead, um, or, or the ability uh, to attach to services. And Scott will tell you more about um, how we're assessing those things in his part of the talk. And then finally, we wanted to we wanted these genes to have predicted functions that span a wide range of tissues. We don't necessarily know that um, RNAi will be effective or be equally effective in all tissues. So we wanted to cast a wide net and make sure that we were, you know, if there's something to see, um, we, we would be able to see it in these initial experiments. So um, right now we're focusing on a list of about 20 uh, candidate genes. And uh, we've been busy making these plasmids, making the bacterial expression constructs, verifying that we have what we think we have. Um, and these are, you know, about half of these genes are, are genes that we think are, you know, really required for some essential cell biological function. And the other half are span most of that collection of uh, uh, the bissel thread attachment fiber making proteins. Um, and this has been the work of Lindsay and Margaret, who, who have uh, really done a great job making all these different constructs and getting them ready to test in zebra mussels. So with that, I'll turn things over to Scott, um, who will tell you about the work that we've been doing this summer in the containment lab. Screen sharing has failed to start. Oh, that's not good. Oh boy. Um, are you guys seeing a title page? Excellent. Oh, thanks, Daryl. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Scott Ballantyne. I'm a professor at UW River Falls. And I'm also a property owner on a lake that's infested with zebra mussels. So I have a very personal interest in this project. Um, I want to update you then today on the progress we're making with the last two steps. Um, in order for our, our, our plan to work, uh, zebra mussels have to consume these modified E. coli. They need to ingest these bacteria. And we really want it to work. So we think it's going to be important that we optimize that, that uptake. 
Uh, a few years ago, I did this experiment together with some students at UWF. And, and what we did is we put small zebra mussels into these plastic tubes. There's one per tube. And uh, then we added water and then we added E. coli to the tubes, but, but they're not normally E. coli. These, these E. coli have been genetically modified so they glow green. And the first three tubes we left alone, those are experimental tubes. And the last three we treated with a chemical a poison called sodium azide. And initially the tubes all glowed that nice green color you see on the left, but over time the glowing went away. And by four days, the glowing in the experimental tubes was completely gone. But importantly, the, the control tubes still glowed. So, so we interpret that to mean that uh, live zebra mussels can indeed filter E. coli. Uh, but, but this took a while, right? This took four days. So we think it's going to be important to increase this uptake. And, and we've spent a, a bit of time this summer trying to find identify ways to do that. Um, Another reason we think that it's going to be important to increase uptake comes from this paper. Um, Daryl already mentioned that RNAi works in oysters and, and they use the exact same system we're trying to use, right? They used E. coli to both produce and deliver the double-stranded RNA. Uh, but what they found is when they fed the E. coli on their own, they didn't work very well. They had to mix them together with an algae first. And, and what they think is going on, they think that the, the E. coli are somehow sticking to the algae and then the algae are delivering the E. coli into the gut of the oyster. Um, and, and so they refer to this strategy then as the Trojan horse strategy, I, I think for obvious reasons. So we think this might be a, a good approach for us. And we think maybe we should be, we should be mixing our E. coli with algae. And, and that led to the question then of which algae. And, and we're actually trying a couple different algae, but I just wanna focus on one. The algae is called Chlamydomonas reinhardii, and I'll probably just call it clammy from now on. It's a safe, harmless, non-pathogenic algae found naturally in our lakes and in our soil, relatively easy to grow. And importantly, there's some of the world's experts on working with this algae uh, on the U of M campus. In fact, they're just down the road from the containment lab. Uh, one of those experts is shown here. It's Pete Levu and the uh, anyways, he coordinates the uh, CRC, which stands for the Chlamydomonas Resource Center. And he and other members of the staff have been really helpful in getting us started working with this algae. And we're now able to grow nice flasks of the green algae like you see on the right there. So the, what gets me most excited about clammy is, is that it can be genetically modified. And in fact, you can use it just like we're using E. coli. You can engineer clammy to produce double-stranded RNA against any gene you want. And, and that's been used now in, in a growing number of uh, papers. Uh, the first one here uh, described using clammy to target a gene from a virus. And, and this is a virus that infects shrimp. And, and my understanding is that these shrimp are grown in these large aquaculture facilities and Periodically, they have die-offs due to infection by this virus. And, and, and what the scientists were able to show, at least in a contained setting in tanks, was if they fed the shrimp this modified algae that produced double-stranded RNA to an essential viral gene, the, the shrimp would, and then they later challenged those shrimp with the, with the virus, uh, they didn't get infected, or at least they didn't get infected as much. So if you think about it, it's actually like that the modified algae is acting like a vaccine, right? They're adding it before the, the insult, in this case, the, the virus. And, and that's a really interesting way to think about genetic biocontrol tools. It's certainly not a way I had thought about it before. I always thought about genetic biocontrol tools as something you would add to a lake after it had been infested by an AIS. But what this paper shows is that, at least perhaps with this algae strategy, it might be worth thinking about using these genetic control agents proactively as a way to protect a lake from infestation. And in fact, I was attending the, one of the lightning talks right before this, and, and I was excited to hear Mike Smansky talking about using their engineered carp in exactly that same way. So I guess I didn't have a, I guess great minds think alike and so do ours. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the second paper uh, looked at another gene. They engineered algae to target a mosquito gene. Uh, and this is a gene that mosquitoes need to develop. And they were able to show, again, in a contained controlled setting that if they put that algae into uh, tanks of water and then put mosquitoes in with them, they really reduced re reproduction of the mosquitoes. 
and their angle is they're trying to reduce uh, mosquito-borne diseases like malaria. So I think these two papers really uh, show that this, this strategy of using engineered algae as a way to deliver double-stranded RNA in aquatic systems has some merit. And, and, and so it's something we're moving towards, but it's certainly not the main focus of this project. So there's two roles really for Clammy then in our project. Um, the first is to serve then as a Trojan horse and, and help us deliver our modified E. coli. And that's really gonna be the main role. But as I mentioned, we're also working on a second approach where the Clammy is actually producing the double-stranded RNA directly. And, and I was on sabbatical last fall and so I made some progress on the second approach. I was able to produce uh, a plasmid that, um, we call P. P clammy. And, and it's essentially the plasmid that was used in the shrimp paper, except that I tweaked it a little bit so that it's better able to receive our zebra mussel gene targets. Uh, and Lindsay and Margaret uh, prepared the plasmid and they've actually been able to move a few zebra mussel genes into it. Um, so this fall in my molecular biology class, I'm hoping that the students can put these, these um, plasmids into clammy. And it's, it's not a single step like I've shown here. It's actually a multi-step process but hopefully we get a few of these engineered algae made and we'll be able to test them next summer. Uh, and I now wanna focus for the rest of the time on what we're going to do. Once we feed these modified microbes to the zebra mussel, what are we gonna measure? What are we gonna look for? That's what we mean by phenotype. And, and I've listed some traits here that I think are important in our, our initial phenotype. I think it should be something that's simple to score. And, and I say that because we're not all zebra mussel experts. I think it should be something that's quantitative so we can use proper statistics. I think it should be something that happens fast because I'm not patient and I think we're gonna have to do a lot of experiments. And I think we should have good gene targets for whatever we're approaching, that's sort of obvious. And finally, I think the, the whatever we test should have some connection to muscle health. And as much as Daryl and I might wanna change the stripes on these muscles into polka dots, it's probably not the best trait. So here I've listed uh, some of the traits that we've considered. You've already heard of a few of them from Daryl in this discussion of our gene targets, but I broke them down here into those that occur quickly and those that take more time. I'm only gonna talk about the fast ones. I mentioned uh, filtration and I'm not gonna say any more about that other than we have tools to measure it. Um, I did consider movement initially, zebra mussels do move. And uh, the problem is that in my initial experiments only a small fraction of the muscles moved. So there's just not enough signal really to work with. And, and that leaves us then with attachment and copper sensitivity. Uh, attachment's really important for muscles. They need to attach to their substrate in order to feed and in order to breed. So, so I came up with a, a test for what's actually reattachment, which I, I made this graphic to illustrate. I jokingly call this zebra muscle Yahtzee. Hope you see why. Uh, what we do is we uh, pluck the muscles off of their native substrate, drop them into a jar. The jar is filled with water and then we incubate, and that's typically for 24 hours. Now this would be the spot in Yahtzee where you, you shook the cup full of dice, but we don't shake the jar. What we do is we put a lid on it and then we um, invert it once. And at that point we dump out the contents and then we count the number of muscles that are attached to the jar. So in this case, there's five attached, five went out. So we get a reattachment score of 50%. So I'm gonna argue that this, at least this phenotype satisfies a lot of the criteria I listed a moment ago. It's, it's definitely simple to perform. Anyone can do this. Uh, it's quantitative, you come up with numbers. It occurs fast. Um, we can get complete reattachment in as little as 24 hours. Uh, and we do have good gene targets. As Daryl mentioned, we have a number of these Bissell genes. We think we may have the complete composition of genes that make up the Bissells. And so we have a number of good gene targets for this. That leaves us then with the question of whether this reattachment test has anything to do with muscle health. And, and, and in thinking about that I, question, I realized that and one of the great things about presentations like this is you get to step away from your day-to-day -day experiments and think about your data sort of collectively in mass. And, and I realized that we already had one level of answer to this question sort of hiding in our data. And so, so what I'm plotting here is the percent reattachment that we saw for our control muscles in various experiments we did throughout the summer. And so Lindsay and Margaret and I have been playing zebra muscle Yahtzee all summer long. And this just shows the amount of attachment that each of the controls gave us. 
and the point I'm trying to make is that they're not all the same, right? There's variation. And that variation, it, it could reflect differences in muscle health between those. Um, but the problem is, it's, that's, that wasn't the purpose of these experiments, right? So there's other variables. Um, these muscles were collected at different times. They weren't always the same size. They're on different substrates. And so it could be one of those other variables that's causing this, this bounce. So I wanted to do a more carefully controlled experiment to get at whether this reattachment really was reflecting muscle health. This slide uh, is a description of what I was, what my, this is my experimental design. And what I did is I took muscles from a common source on a common substrate. It was Lake Minnetonka and they were all on rocks. I plucked off muscles that were the same size or at least close to the same size and I distributed them in jars. At this point, I wanted to make the muscles and some of the jars sick. So, so I decided to add varying amounts of the chemical copper sulfate. I, I knew that at high amounts, copper sulfate would kill the muscles. So my reasoning was at lower doses, it should make them ill. I then uh, let those incubate for a while, it was 24 hours, and then did the reattachment assay. So this shows the results of one trial. Um, we, we, cons we got pretty good reattachment in this trial of the control with no copper sulfite added. If we add a high dose of copper sulfate, we completely inhibit reattachment. And these intermediate doses gave us intermediate attachment, right? It's less than the control, but greater than the high dose of copper. And, and I should say, we saw this consistently. I did this a number of times and that, that reproduced. And, I got pretty excited about this because first of all, I think it answered the question I had in the previous slide. It looks like sick muscles really don't attach as well as healthy ones. So that means that we can use this reattachment as a, a proxy for how healthy the muscles are. And, and the reason that's so important is that initially I thought this silly little test was only gonna be good for our abyssal genes, right? which is good, we, we need a test for them. But what this indicates is we can use this test to really test a larger collection of our genes, which aren't directly involved in attachment, but have a more indirect role. So I made a simple slide to illustrate how that might work. And, and the basic idea is simple. We're just going to substitute our, our double-stranded RNA producing microbes for the copper sulfate. And so here I've got four jars lined up. And in each one, I put a different type of bacteria, right? Each of these bacteria is targeting a different zebra muscle gene. And I just called them genes A, B, and C. And this is our control, which targets a gene that has nothing to do with zebra muscles. We put our muscles in, do the, the attachment assay. And then this is just a hypothetical result over on the right. If gene A and gene C give similar reattachment to the control, we, we kind of pass on those. And then we get excited about gene B because it's showing reduced reattachment. So that implies it's less healthy uh, and you know, just like the copper sulfate treatment was causing it. So the danger in me showing you a slide like this is that you think we can get this all done in a weekend and that's definitely not the case. There's a whole lot of variables that need to be optimized and dealt with here. Um, told you we're dealing with composition of the treatment, whether we should mix the bacteria with algae, how much of each, so the dosing is important how frequently to add that, how long to let the treatment go. These are the detailed questions that are really why science takes so long. So another reason I got really excited about the copper result was it, it suggested to me at least a way that we might be able to use RNAi to, to make muscles more sensitive to copper. And the reason I was excited about that is I was aware of the work from from uh, Diane Wallen and Angelique Dahlberg showing that low dose copper can at least potentially be used in a lake setting to treat zebra mussels right now. At least that's what they're trying. And, and that's because cop, uh, zebra mussels are already pretty sensitive to this poison. Um, but let's face it, copper sulfate is a pretty broad spectrum poison and you gotta get the dose, dose just right. If you give too much, everything's gonna die. So wouldn't it be great if we could make just zebra mussels like super, super, super sensitive to copper sulfate? And if we did that, we'd only have to use like a teeny, teeny, teeny amount. And, and I heard a term today for what, what, I can't remember it now, but this, this pairing together of technologies, that's really what I'm getting at, is maybe we can use RNAi together with another technology. It'll come to me after. <clears throat> but here's what that would look like. Um, so here is my, re I'm just showing you the trial I showed you a moment ago with copper sulfate. Remember these intermediate doses don't attach that well. But now if we come up with some um, DSRNA microbe 
that gives us increased RNAi resistance, increased, gives us increased copper sensitivity, uh, what we should see is the, um, so the curve should switch to the right, right? So what, what should happen is muscles that are in this low dose of copper should start behaving like they're in this high dose. Right? And, and so the gene X then would probably be one of these candidate copper resistance genes. And, and Daryl didn't show you those. Well, he did kind of, he showed you some of our stress response genes and those are definitely probably in this category. But we also have some very specific genes that we think will be directly involved in copper sensitivity. So I wanna end them by just listing four ways that I think RNAi might aid zebra muscle management. This is a long-term thing, not what we're planning to get done in the next year. Um, it could reveal targets for, uh, gene targets for DNA-based genetic biocontrol. So this would be the CRISPR-based strategy that Mike Spansky's group is talking about. Um, it, it could provide a really powerful tool to help us understand muscles better. Both Darren and I have seen, witnessed this for model systems. It's really amazing what happens once you have RNAi in a genome. Um, but I'm most interested in these last two, the direct applications. It's conceivable that this and future work could help us identify novel dsRNA mollicides. So these would be chemicals, double-stranded RNA is a chemical, that target muscles and kill muscles, but in this case, only zebra muscles. That's the beauty of genome-based approaches, that we should be able to find a sequence that's at least, that's unique to zebra muscles. And so these chemicals then would only act on them. And finally, the holy grail, um, I would like to see or hope to see this strategy used to develop uh, some sort of RNAi based genetic biocontrol agent. I heard a lot today about Mike Smansky's control and I wish we could do that in zebra muscles. I wish we could do CRISPR, it's a great system. Um, but like Daryl said, we don't have the ability to do that right now. So this could be a workaround. And, and the way it would work is we would add uh, living microbes that produce double stranded RNA. And, and the most likely candidate would be those algae. And we'd add them to either infested or as I mentioned, possibly uninfested waters as a way to protect those waters. And um, they, the advantage of adding living creatures like this is they're making more of themselves constantly, right? So they're constantly providing this, this, uh, uh, this harm to the muscle. And, and so providing at least some level of a cure as opposed to just a treatment. Uh, I'd like to end them by thanking uh, Maserk for coordinating this showcase and for supporting us through the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. I wanna thank UWF for supporting my sabbatical last fall. Uh, and I think my partners, Daryl Goyle and Mike McCartney, they've been great to work with this last time. <clears throat> they've been great to work with this summer. And I guess with that, I'll stop sharing and we'll take questions. All right, thank you, Daryl and Scott. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. So if you have questions, again, either points of clarification or um, kind of expanding on the presentations here, please drop those in the Q&A box. Um, I can kind of kick us off with um, lots of times when we talk about this project, both when the mapping of the genome was happening a few years ago, and now we get the question of um, how, how is this technique, this approach, how do you know that it's species specific and won't affect native muscles or um, other kinds of muscles in water bodies once it is released. Um, can you kind of speak to that? You touched on it a little already in your presentations, but a little more directly answer that question. I'll, I'll try. Um, it's sort of a two level answer. The first is computational. We, we do our best to identify a, a, a DNA sequence that's only found in, in zebra muscles, but recognize we haven't sequenced everything. So, so we'd look at all the things we'd sequenced, you know, we've sequenced bluegill, walleye, stuff like that. And we'd look through all their genomes and make sure that whatever sequence we're considering using doesn't accidentally line up with one of their genes. Um, but, you know, the problem is we haven't sequenced everything. So it will also take studies by scientists, not like myself and Daryl, but more traditional organismal type biologists to, to go out and sample these in sort of a controlled environmental setting and make sure they don't do collateral damage that we're not thinking of. Thank you. Um, another question that came in is, what are the potential negative side effects of the LG approach that you presented on, Scott? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty fresh idea. So um, the, 
no, what else? Let's, let's spin that. Let's talk about the positives. Uh, <laughs> the, the positive of it is you're not adding an invasive species, right? This creature is already in our lakes. So uh, in fact, I asked that question of, of Mike Smansky just a moment ago. He, he's talking about using his carp prophylactically, but those are invasive. Um, so our, our algae would already be in the lake. So the danger, if there is one, would come from what we've added to the algae, right? And it would be this little bit of DNA that is making these small double-stranded RNAs. Um, there's strategies, of course, to control the algae, uh, just like any uh, modified creature, um, which could fail. But if it failed, you'd have a, a, an algae in the lake that's already there. Okay, that kind of addresses another question that came in. But um, after, if this technology works, after zebra mussels are eliminated, eliminated from a lake, um, what then happens to that special algae? Does it stay in the lake? Do you kind of what's that next step? Is it? Can you address that a little bit? I could try. Um, you know, I tend to not, I'm not thinking that far ahead. I'd love to see it work yeah. in the lab. And I'll, I'll just stress that we're working only in the lab. Um, but it, it's worth thinking long term. And, you know, like as I mentioned, I'm, I know there are tools that we can engineer into the algae that would make it self limiting. And, and one of the great things about having this CRC resource right nearby is they have, they have every mutant algae ever created right there. So I, I would right away go to Pete and say, how do we do this? How do we keep these algae from being able to perpetuate indefinitely? You know, how can we build in a, a safety net? That's great. Um, with either of these kind of, and I guess jointly this approach, um, assuming that it works, this is kind of a hard question to answer, but can you project out kind of what the cost would be for this management tool? Would it be something that is very expensive, only to be used in kind of key places, something that's accessible, um, kind of speak to that timeline a little bit. Yeah, I think um, I think it really depends on the pathway that is taken to apply it in the field. So, you know, Scott mentioned there could be a few different ways of, uh, of actually doing the application, right? One would be essentially a chemical approach, which would be you know, producing these double strand RNAs and, and, and applying them. That would be, you know, local, local application. Um, you could also grow up large quantities of, back, of these bacteria and kind of heat kill them and then, you know, in, or, or, and introduce the genetically modified organisms that aren't capable of reproducing in the lake, right? Um, and actually there's a, a precedent for that already in, in treating zebra mussels, which is Zequinox. Uh, that, that's actually derived, or it's, it's a bacterial treatment, right? So it's a particular strain of Pseudomonas fluorescens that uh, causes the guts of zebra mussels to deteriorate and it's introduced in, you know, large quantities. That, that approach, I mean, the, the problems with that is that it is expensive and it's difficult to, um, you know, it, it can only be applied in sort of local areas, right? Um, so, you know, I think, I think short of introducing these uh, kind of live organisms to the wild, um, RNAi as a direct strategy would, would be likely to be probably on par with Zequinox and probably have similar limitations in terms of its uh, both expense and effectiveness. But, you know, I, I think right now I see a huge value for this work in, you know, giving us a research tool, giving us a way to potentially manipulate and ask questions in zebra mussels, um, laying the groundwork for a future when we could apply, you know, uh, DNA-based tools like CRISPR um, for, for population control in a way that's similar to, to you know, things that are being done in mosquitoes and, and you know, other undesirable organisms right now. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there is a potential for this approach to be directly applied um, in, in the ways that, you know, that Scott mentioned. Uh, but, you know, that that's obviously something that require, that, that's going to require, uh, uh, you know, that sort of public political conversation of, you know, what are, what is the cost benefits of this? And I mean, I'm really glad to see that NASERC is starting to um, engage with people and, and start to, you know, get some information through the, the project that David Fulton is running in, you know, how the public does perceive these types of interventions and does perceive those cost benefit calculations. Okay. Um, so in our last minute, I want to ask this last question that we got in, because I think it's a great kind of close for this session. 
Um, but what do you think is the overall importance of this research and how do you see it affecting science in the future? So kind of big picture, how is this making a splash in the field? Well, I, I can speak for myself and maybe I'll let Scott take a crack too. Um, I mean, for, for me, you know, this is a really challenging problem, right? So I, I'm trained as a, I, I trained and did my PhD in fruit fly genetics, which is a really, you know, well-established uh, genetic model system. It's got a hundred years of technology development and tools that make it very easy to kind of make these types of manipulations. Um, zebra mussels are complete uncharted territory at this point, right? So just learning the basics of how to work with them and how to, um, you know, keep them alive, how to test things and, you know, that develop these assays that we can use to, to study phenotypes. Um, you know, I think that that's really laying a lot of groundwork for, uh, you know, being able to do more sophisticated things, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think hopefully at the end of this two-year project, um, we'll have some indication of whether RNAi is a viable approach. And, and that's going to, you know, either give us a very powerful research tool or, you know, or, or, you know, potentially rule this out as a strategy and, and you know, cause us to, to look in a different direction. I see we're out of time. So I'll just say, I basically echo his, his answer. And I tell my students, it's the ultimate final exam for me because it, I, this is the biggest scientific puzzle I've certainly ever tackled. These things are tough to work on. Uh, it seems like everything's moving. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it, just little advances, right? Figuring out how to effectively deliver E. coli to them. Yeah, that's, a, that's a move forward. And science moves, moves in small steps. And, and so even if we don't solve the problem, we're going to make a contribution. Thank you both so much for your work and for presenting for us today. Um, I'm going to wrap us up there. Uh, for the audience, a reminder that our poster session is now open. Um, and I'm going to drop a link to those posters and the different sessions into the chat box. Um, our grad students have worked very hard on a bunch of posters. So if you have a few minutes to drop into those, um, they have their posters ready for you and ready to answer any questions that you have and kind of give you a brief overview of their work, um, kind of the specific work that they're doing on some of our research projects. So hop over there if you have some time. Um, but thank you again, Scott and Beryl. We appreciate you being here. Um, and yes, hope that we can get another update at next year's showcase with some more positive developments on this front. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.